Hi, I'm Joe. I'm an alcoholic. All of us here at White Chip hope that you've been enjoying our audiobooks and AA speakers. You are welcome to join our Facebook group. Just click the link in the description and say hello. If you support the Alcoholic Anonymous cause, please hit the like and subscribe button. We upload new AA content every day, so if you want to see more, hit the notifications button. This way, you'll be the first to know we've uploaded a new video. Without further ado, let's listen to the next AA speaker. Best-selling author and full-time recovery advocate Chris Kennedy Wofford joining us tonight on Recovery Coast to Coast. He's been on the show a number of times. Most recently, we had a chance to sit down with Chris at Tavern on the Green at the celebration honoring Adele Smithers, America's first lady of alcoholism, understanding, and awareness, uh, a woman that uh, has done so much for this field. Chris shared his own personal story of recovery back in 2005 with the book Symptoms of Withdrawal. Now, if you have not read that, I suggest that you do. It's a striking and poignant portrayal of addiction and the road to long-term recovery. Chris has been in recovery since February 17th, back in 1986. At the age of 30, he was simply sick and tired of being sick and tired, reached out to one of his cousins who was in recovery, and the journey began. Now, the latest book on recovery is a gem. It's called Moments of Clarity, Voices from the Front Lines of Addiction and Recovery. Chris told me about it when we were together in New York City, and I was pretty anxious for this to be published. Forty-four stories told by people in recovery. Now, most of them are well-known, told in their own voice, sharing a slice of what it was like, what happened, and what it's like now. The idea certainly is not new. PBS talk show host Dennis Holy profiled a number of prominent people in recovery in his book, Courage to Change, back in 1984. Gary Stromberg, a few years ago, published The Heart of a Fall, again with prominent people sharing their walk along the road to recovery, including Doc Ellis, Richard Pryor, Dr. John, and others. The power of these personal stories definitely saves lives, plain and simple. I have seen it over and over again in my 30 years in this field. And if you want what these people have and are willing to go to any lengths to get it, recovery can be yours. We've had hundreds and hundreds of people in long-term recovery on our program, Recovery Coast to Coast, and they all have something in common, that moment of absolute clarity, and that's what Chris Lawford was able to capture in the personal stories of 44 amazing individuals, including some that you know, like Alec Baldwin, Ed Begley Jr., Richard Dreyfus, Tom Arnold, Martin Sheen, Rudy Tomjanovich, Richard Lewis, Hollywood Henderson, and a lot more. But Chris also introduces us to some new friends, like Velvet Mangan, who has dedicated her life to helping women with children. Earl Hightower, who's been a beacon of recovery in L.A. for many, many years. Chris Meacham, an Internet blogger. Marie Morning Glory, who started Miracle House. And Mike Early, the CEO of Karen Treatment Center, one of the leading treatment programs in America, headquartered in Pennsylvania. It's a wonderful book filled with rigorous honesty. Chris joins us by phone from New York City. Chris, welcome back to Recovery Coast to Coast. Neil, yeah, it's great to be here. Thanks for having me. We let listeners know about a week or so ago that you were going to be on the show and asked them to submit some questions via email, so we will get right to it. Fantastic. First up, William in Roanoke, Virginia, writes and says, How long did it take you to do all the interviews in this book, and were they all in-person interviews? They were. Um, they, it took about, I would say, a little over a year. That was probably the most difficult part of, of, of doing Moments of Clarity was actually First of all, you know, it's a difficult thing to do, ask people to, you know, to, to talk about these things. I mean, it's, you never know if they're going to, and it was, you know, some people said yes right away. A lot of people said no. Um, even with people that are really well-known and really powerful, there's still a great, there's, there's a lot of fear about uh, being pigeonholed or the stigma of addiction um, that people just don't want to just don't want to go there and uh, and then of course just sort of getting finding the time I wanted absolutely to interview everybody in person um, there were a couple of folks that um, that I met you know Chris Meacham you mentioned over the internet that I did did on the phone because he was in he was not anywhere that I could get to so I did him over the phone but everybody else I I did in person and I, I felt that that was a really important component of this these stories are very personal they're um, uh, they're they're very heartfelt um, and they're very private and I wanted to you know I wanted to create that uh, atmosphere when I t- when I when I when I did, did the actual interviews. Chris Lawford joining us tonight. Moments of Clarity is the new book. Shirley from Austin, Texas writes: As a person in long-term recovery, what did you learn from writing this book, and how has this book enhanced your recovery? Well, I you know I, again I, I mean the the the, the overwhelming sense uh that i had from doing the interviews for a moment of clarity was the honor that i that i feel to be a part of this 
this journey with these folks. I mean, and and to also understand how 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 brave uh, people are that really do do decide to confront their their addiction. Um, and their ongoing, you know, the the, the ongoing um, underlying causes and conditions which which create their alcoholism and their and their and their addiction. Um, so so that that was a, a big part of it. And I also think that the diversity of these moments of clarity were were, were extraordinary for me. Um, they all had similar things in common, which were sort of this this idea of surrender and and also kind of hitting bottom. But but they are all a little bit different, and 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 that was that was interesting. Chuck Taylor, of Miami, Florida, writes: Were there sobriety requirements in terms of years for those you chose for the book? That's a great question. I you know I I thought about you know having a a cut off at like five years or so, some arbitrary number, and then I thought, why would I do that? Because I I I, I think everybody in the book, uh, at, when I interviewed them, had uh, relatively long term sobriety, but I didn't. It was not a requirement. I felt like a moment of clarity is a moment of clarity, and you can have it, and then you can let it go. You know, the interesting thing about a moment of clarity, or what Carl Jung called a psychic change moment, is that. Um, it's not something that you ask for. It's not something that you really prepare for. It's not something that you demand. It's something that, that just happens and you have to accept it. Um, and, you know, you can accept that moment and then you can turn your back on that moment. Um, I know my father who died of alcoholism when he, when he was 60 years old. I know he had a moment of clarity because I talked to him around the time he had that moment of clarity. But he, uh, like many others, uh, chose not to uh, follow through on it for whatever reason. He, 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 I guess, didn't understand what he had. And that's the interesting thing about these moments is they happen, and it's not like getting struck by a lightning bolt on the donkey to Damascus. It's really kind of a an, uh, an evolutionary thing. You have, like for me, I had that moment at those windows on February 17, 1986, where I was going to put a gun on my mouth or I was going to surrender. I didn't understand that that was a profound moment for me. I thought it was just like a lot of the other times that I was sick and tired of being sick and tired. But I got to a level that I didn't really understand that day until until months later, actually. And so often with these moments of clarity, like Kelly McGillis talks about in, in her story, she she had overdosed basically. They brought her back. She wanted help. She asked for help. She had the she actually had a moment of clarity where she where she felt a voice deep inside of her go, "Not yet." And she spent five and a half years trying to get out of the car that was taking her to treatment. Now, if she had gotten out, she would never. She would have turned her back on that moment of clarity. But fortunately, she didn't get out of that car. The book is Moments of Clarity: Voices from the Front Lines of Addiction and Recovery, published by Harper Collins, and available at Amazon.com and other online book publishers. It's it's a great book, and if you have uh, people that you give gifts to in terms of their recovery anniversary, their AA birthday, this is a great one. Back to the questions. Lauren, Portland, Maine. Was it difficult getting 44 people, or were there some who didn't make it in this book, but might be in a future book? Will there be more moments of clarity? Well, that's, you know, I, I would love that. I mean, I think that there, you know, a lot of the folks uh, in this book, uh, in, in Moments of Clarity, are contemporaries of mine. I would love to do a book around the families. I would love to do a book with younger folks in it. I think there's, you know, there's a wealth of experience and a wealth of uh of opportunity here to do more books. We'll just have to see how well this book sells. I mean, as you know, as everybody out there knows, I mean, the, these uh, the future books are going to be generated by how well this book does. So if this book sells well and people resonate to it, there may be opportunities to do more books. Um, I think that, um, you know, there were some folks, there were more interviews. Um, some folks decided at the last minute to pull themselves out of the book. Um, which was somewhat disheartening but understandable to me. Um, and there was a lot of other people that I could have interviewed that I didn't. I had a list of over 150 people that ultimately, you know, probably 130 of them could have been in this book. It would have been a long book, though. Joan in Minneapolis writes in and she says, How did you deal with personal anonymity? Doesn't this violate the traditions of 12-step programs at the level of press, radio, and films? We deal with this on the show all the time, Chris. What's your response to this? That, that's a great question. And, and, you know, I mean, first of all, I have to say that nobody in this book represents being a part of any 12-step uh, group or 
any organization. So that's that's the first thing. Um, the actual tradition in 12 steps, because I looked into this, uh, because I was very concerned that if there were anybody, that if there were any people that were in 12-step recovery, that their anonymity was protected. And the, and basically the, the tradition is, the letter of the tradition is, is no last names and no frontal photography um, at, in identification with any 12-step organization. Now, the spirit of the tradition might be a little bit more than that in the sense that you know, you might want to, you might not want to talk about some of the buzzwords that go along with some of those organizations, uh, some of those 12 step groups. Um, I, again, I don't, that, so this book absolutely does not violate that tradition I, on any level, and I've, I've been very, very clear with, uh, with, with all of the media that I've spoken to that nobody in this book represents, nor does it say anywhere in the book, does it mention any 12 step group except when I talk about uh, anonymity in the beginning of the book and in the introduction. And it's interesting, Chris, you talk about 12-step meetings as being mutual support meetings. How did you come to that term to kind of embrace all of this? Well, I got to tell you, Neil, that I do, that that I I talk about mutual mutual support groups and recovery meetings. That that is not that is not any kind of code for 12 steps. Um, because obviously, if it was, then I then I would be violating it, the spirit of the tradition, if not the letter of the tradition. So that that those are not any that those are just the way people talk about their mutual support groups. Um, those can be any number of things. Um, they do not. As a, again, I will say, nobody in this book identifies as being a member of any 12-step organization. Dennis in Boise, Idaho, wants to know: Were there common denominators of recovery in those you interviewed? Um, I think I, I think everybody in this book understands that uh, recovery from uh, drug and alcohol or substance abuse uh, is not just about getting rid of the substances. That there are sort of a there's a fundamental difference in the folks that are that they need to deal with after they put away the drugs and the alcohol. I think the Common denominators in recovery are basically that, you know, that there is something, uh, a lot of these folks for the first time in their lives found, um, something bigger than themselves to believe in and to help them. I think that, um, uh, you know, and, and a lot of folks, uh, obviously everybody in this book had some kind of moment of clarity. Sherry, in Albany, New York, were all 44 people uh, in a 12-step program, or were there people who found a different path? Again, I, you know, there are, I don't represent anybody in this book as being part of any 12-step organization, because even though that wouldn't be a violation of a 12-step tradition, a particular 12-step tradition, I, I found it very important not to associate anybody with any organization or any uh, institution or any 12-step group. Certainly, uh, certainly spirituality was a common denominator in all of this, was it not? Absolutely. Um, I think, and you know, but, but there are, there's a guy in the book who was basically, when he came in, an atheist, um, and uh, he found his, uh, the, the power to help him in a group of, in a, in a group of people. Uh, and a group of recovering people that he associated with. So that was, that was his kind of way. So, but I think that the, the, and when you talk about spiritual, when you, when you, when you mean something that's sort of inexplicable and out of this world, absolutely there's, there's, there's elements of that in everybody's story. I was very struck by Steve Earle's definition of spirituality in your book. He says spirituality is one person's individual one-on-one -on -one relationship with God. It doesn't have anything to do with anyone else. People can get spiritual in a group, but really it's just like dying. You can have your family all around, all your friends, but when you go, you're going by yourself. Yeah, that's right. And Steve is such a brilliant guy, and he's so thoughtful, and he's so smart. I mean, you know, the thing about this book, I mean, that was great. And he, you know, he, t he talked about his spirituality versus religion, and and and, uh, and and he's absolutely right. And I think everybody in this has a very personal relationship with a God of their own understanding. And... Um, that that's absolutely true, and you, you mentioned Earl Hightower. He's another one who has a profound yeah. uh, uh, knowledge and and uh, um, uh, understanding of recovery and uh, of the underlying causes and conditions of our humanity. Really, 
Chris Kennedy Law for joining us tonight on Recovery Coast to Coast. Moments of Clarity is the name of the book. Tim in Washington, D.C. writes, How was the book arranged? It starts with Jim Vance, who I've been watching for years on our local news station, so it obviously wasn't alphabetically. Did it follow a theme? No, it didn't. It actually just sort of materialized. A friend of mine said, you know, because I was so worried about um, who was going to be in the book and how it was going to be organized and and all of that that I um, and he said you know what don't worry about it whoever's going to show up and whoever's supposed to be in the book will be in it and whatever order they're going to be in what they'll be in and it, it just worked out perfectly I worked with a wonderful woman who's not in recovery her name is Jan Warner um, and she's a writer and she she helped me organize the essays she helped me um, she helped me you know basically put the essays together from the from the um, interview tapes. She's a wonderful writer, and she she helped me. And we had a great editor at Harper Collins named Marjorie Brayman, who helped with the organization of it. I love Jim Vance's story. I I never met Jim Vance before. I I was introduced to him uh, him by a mutual friend, and his story was so profound to me. Um, uh, and I think it worked out well. And then to have you know on the opposite side of that to have this guy D J Verrett who spent 19 years in a in a federal prison um, and had his moment of clarity in an isolation cell uh, when he was deprived of alcohol and drugs for nine months in that prison was is, was just a profound way to bookend these amazing stories. It is a great book. If you know someone in recovery who celebrates an annual birthday, I would certainly suggest getting a copy of this Moments of Clarity, Voices from the Front Lines of Addiction and Recovery, published by HarperCollins, available at Amazon.com and other online book publishers. Jane in Chicago writes... Uh, Chris, did you ask all the people the same questions, and how long did each interview last? I did. I asked everybody in Moments of Clarity the exact same questions. Um, sometimes we would get off, you know, obviously on tangents, but I, I had about, I'd say about 12 or 13 questions, um, and I asked them all the same questions, and each interview took about, an hour, give or take, and uh, some people like Steve Earle just went on forever because he has so much to say, and every bit of it was. Yeah. I mean, I, if I, I wish I could have put his whole, uh, his whole um, talk into the book because it was so brilliant. And there were a lot of people like that, but they, they all lasted about an hour, give or take. Some of the highlights from the book, TV anchorman Jim Vance talking about taking a shotgun to a park to commit suicide. Susan Schieffer, who was on our show a few weeks ago, had a marvelous quote, clarity without spirituality is a dangerous thing. Dr. Ron <laughs> Smith referring to the windows of change and faith as a choice. And Judy Collins, who looked so good on the outside for so many years, but was certainly dying inside until she found her connection to recovery in the form of Dr. Stan Gitlow. In fact, Judy talks about... Uh, driving a garbage truck while in recovery. She also talks about her son's suicide when she was sober for 13 years and how she made it through that tragic time. And, and I love Ed Begley's comment. He has a wonderful outlook. He says that today all his problems are quality problems. Right, right. Uh, Jennifer in Baton Rouge, Louisiana, does the book deal at all with families who so frequently get overlooked in the process of treatment and recovery? Um, the book doesn't. I mean, it, it deals specifically with the individual's particular moment of clarity. And often that, you know, that has to do with family. I mean, Tom Arnold talks about, um, you know, driving up to his gate. He was living with Roseanne Barr at the time and, and her kids, and he was, you know, completely out of his mind, and he had driven up to the gate, and he had forgotten the co code to the gate, and it actually was his birthday. <laughs> and he had forgotten it, and he and he rang the bell, and Roseanne came down, and he was convinced he was, she was going to beat him up or or yell at him or something, and she just opened the gate, and she put his, her arms around him and said, you know, I just want you to come home. And the idea that his moment of clarity happened, that it was just this unconditional love, that somebody could see him at his worst, and it would be okay. And I think, you know, that, so I think... I would love to, if this book does well, you know, investigate some kind of a book about the families because I agree this is a family disease. It needs to be addressed that way, um, obviously. And there's, you know, the, the genesis for, for Moments of Clarity was the fact that I, when I was running around the country for, for selling uh, symptoms of withdrawal and, and talking for care and treatment centers, I, I saw, you know, the, 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 the 90% of the 26 million Americans suffering from substance abuse and, and then they, you know, the other 75 million that are directly impacted by that substance abuse. And I saw many of those folks and I saw the, the need for some kind of hope in their eyes. And I, and that was the, that was the reason this book happened. 
Um, obviously, the families of folks that are dealing with this illness are are also desperate for for um, some kind of hope and some kind of uh, you know uh, book that will that will give them that kind of uh, reassurance that there is a way out of this thing. And so maybe we'll do it down the road. Uh, Chris Mel J. in Little Rock, Arkansas, writes and says, Can you talk about your remembrances of Bob Timmons, who was in the book but died last year? He was instrumental in getting my brother into recovery in L.A. many years ago. Uh, Bob was such an amazing guy. He uh, he was one of the first people I interviewed. And, I, you know, because he was such a presence in the in the in the recovering community nationally, but obviously in Los Angeles where he lived, and I I I known of Bob for many many years. I didn't know Bob very well at all, and he obviously he agreed right away to the interview, and and was and and actually was one of the interviews that I used to actually sell the book to my publisher. And I remember, um, you know, I was so nervous that this book would be a celebrity book, and I it, it's not what I what I wanted. I, I understood that I needed people in it that were well known because that was the only way that a publisher would agree to publish this book. But I you know, obviously I and and I this is not a book about, you know, the the deep dark, you know, descent into drugs and alcohol. Obviously people contextualize their moment, but this is really a book about that moment. Um, as 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 clearly as I could get the people to talk about it, and Bob's story, um, you know, about San Quentin and and his transformation and his his moment was so. Uh, I remember the editor, who was a new editor that had inherited this book, because the woman who bought it had left the, pu- the publishing house. She called me up and she goes, you know, I love this book, and I and I thought it was because of you know Richard Dreyfus or some of the other. People that were well known. She goes, no, because of Bob Timmons. That mm-hmm. that story is is so raw and so honest and so what Bob was, which was you know just a guy who was uh, he was a pit bull of recovery and 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 is going to be you know really missed. Uh, it it kind of reminded me many years ago. I was the editor of Alcoholism and Addiction magazine and did a cover story on Billy Carter, who died mm-hmm. about three months later. And 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 know that uh, doing the interview and then have someone someone pass away. But Bob's story is an absolute amazing story, and uh, I can see why you used it to pitch the publisher. Uh, was it difficult to get Harper Collins to say yes? Actually, no. I mean, it was pretty amazing. I mean, they they um, I had another book deal with them after Sentence of a Twelve, so I had to bring them this book. I didn't know that they would buy it. I really, you know, didn't. I didn't really know. I don't know the book business. That's really not what I've been. I've been an actor for twenty years, so I had no instinct whether they would buy it or not. And I was really kind of surprised when you know they bought it right away. I mean, they were really, and they're really. Um, they are really behind it. They've worked really hard. I did Good Morning America this morning. I've, I'm getting a lot of media on the book, which is a good thing uh, for the book. And uh, they're really pushing it hard. And they've, you know, they've they've done a really good job in trying to promote it. I, you know, I hope it works. Your background obviously is in films. Uh, tell me about Richard Lewis and the film Drunks and your involvement in that. Oh, that <laughs> that was a that was an interesting episode. Peter Cohn, who actually. Um, sort of adapted Gary Lennon's uh, uh, play, which was an amazing play, and uh, he came to me uh, and asked me if I would help him develop it and try to raise money for it. I, at the time, was working on all my children as an actor in New York, and I tried. I, we, I helped him a little bit and sort of forgot about it. We didn't raise any money, and and then about uh, you know eight months later, or something, he called me up and he goes, "Listen, I got the money to do this movie. I got Richard Lewis and." And I want you to play the bartender, and I thought that was that was really <laughs> really appropriate. And uh, it was it was great. I've worked with Richard, and then we be, sort of became friends, and we've stayed in touch. And he's uh, such a wonderful story, and so funny in this book. It's, uh, I got to, you know, we, it's it, it was great. And then we actually went to Sundance because it was in the Sundance Film Festival, Drunks, and it was a it was a it was a good experience. Very, very dark film, but very poignant as well. Yes, very, very, very. Charmaine in Fargo, North Dakota, is there an audio version of your book? I would love to hear the voices that go with the stories. 
I would too. Um, and I, you know, unfortunately, um, I didn't, I was not as systematic and as, I had to get people when I could get them and I sometimes interviewed people in restaurants and sometimes on, you know, on park benches and sometimes in an office and so the quality of the recordings is not so good and I think that it would have been difficult to organize the actual the actual voices of those people to do their own, you know, I, I, I think that would have been asking too much. So it never came up. And I don't, I don't think I'm the one to do the audio on it. So I don't think there will be an audio version. Chris Kennedy offered the book is Moments of Clarity, Voices from the Front Lines of Addiction and Recovery. Uh, you approached a lot of people on this project. Some said yes, some said no. Of those who said no, what were the main reasons? Well, I think there was, you know, to be honest, I think there were two things. One was, I think there was, just a fear of being pigeonholed as another, you know, uh, an addict or another alcoholic or somebody who's, you know, sort of that public kind of, I'm a celebrity talking about my drug addiction and alcoholism. And I, and I, I think that's, you know, that's legitimate and it's kind of unfortunate, but it's something that's sort of fostered by the media where, you know, in the, especially in the entertainment media, this disease is treated as kind of a, a joke. Um, and it's, you know, the way they, they, they publicize the people who are having a hard time is makes anybody who really wants to talk about this as a serious issue, as a serious mental illness, as a serious medical issue, it's difficult to have that kind of gravitas. That's number one. The second reason people gave, which I think is, 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 is very legitimate, is the fact that many people felt that revealing these kinds of stories is not what we should be doing, that these are stories to, that are meant from one person to another. They're not meant to be in a book. They're not meant to be disseminated broadly. They're, you know, one drunk talking to another drunk. And I can't argue with that. I really think that's where the power is for a lot of this. But I've, I've been out there, and, and if you had talked to me before I did symptoms of withdrawal, I would have told you, I don't talk about this stuff publicly. I only talk about it with recovery groups and with people that I know that are in recovery. I don't talk about this publicly. Having been forced to go out in a public way because I sold my memoir, which was a memoir, not a recovery book. It just happened to have a lot of recovery in it because I'm, you know, that's a big part of my life. Um, but having been out there now um, and seeing the need for this as a public health issue, 26 million Americans suffering from some kind of substance abuse disorder, less than 10% getting any kind of treatment, billions of dollars lost in lost productivity, criminal costs, uh, uh, incarceration costs, domestic violence issues. I mean, you name it, national security issues. I mean, it's, it's a huge problem that needs to be addressed. And and I, I find myself in a position where um, I can do something to to – to increase that dialogue. I also think that given where we're at politically now, we have a new administration. Health care is going to be a top priority. Um, it's very important that we maintain the recovering community, maintain a presence at the table, that we made, that we build on the parity bill that was passed by Jim Ramstead and Patrick Kennedy, um, that we, that we, um, that we, demand that mental illness and, and substance abuse disorders are not shortchanged when it comes to the revamping of our health care systems. You do a lot of work with Karen Treatment Centers as a public advocacy consultant. T talk a little bit about Karen and, and what they offer. They've been around forever. I remember when I first came into this field, it was called Chit Chat Farms. That's yeah, they were. It was, you know, yeah, and Dick Karen basically just opened it. He was a recovering alcoholic who opened his home to anybody who needed, you know, he basically was doing 12-step calls. Um, and bringing people into his house and sobering them up. And then, you know, it, Karen has been around for a long, long time, and I got sober in the East, and I had always heard about this place down in, the, in Pennsylvania that had great, you know, uh, great treatment, and they had a great uh, codependency program or a, a family of origin issue program, which I actually went to. It's a four- or five-day program, which is an amazing program. Um, they have great spirituality there. They have a priest there named Father Bill who gives a Sunday mass. It's extraordinary. Um, and they, they help a lot of people. And, um, and they do it in a way. And, you know, the thing that really convinced me to go to work for Karen when I, I could have gone to work for any, anybody else. And actually I live on the West Coast. So 
and they're on the East Coast, so I have to travel a lot to do the work I do for them, but is that they give away more charity care than any treatment center in the country. They give away over $9 million a year in charity care. Now, you know how expensive treatment can be, good treatment, and they, they offer reasonable treatment, but it's not it's not cheap. And they're not not for profit, and they're and they they have you know they have a a, a huge overhead. They do psychos, you know they they have psychiatrists. They do the whole deal, and it costs money. But they give you know they're able to supplement people so that 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 not everybody has to you know pay full fare, and and which is an important deal in this, especially in this economy. What do you do for them, Chris? I basically go around the country talking about addiction as, an, as a public health issue. Um, I've done, you know, I've done a lot of work in Washington for them. I'm not a lobbyist, but I do, you know, awareness basically, and I do speeches. I mean, that's pretty much what I do for them. Um, they have, you know, Carol McKay down in, in uh, Washington, who's who's been, you know, who's been a real strong recovery person and done a lot of good work in terms of uh, the Hill, in terms of making sure, you know, that we're that we're well represented on the Hill. But I do, I do mostly, you know, public awareness for them. Uh, Chris Kennedy Wofford, Moments of Clarity is the name of the book, and with with a nice introduction by Patrick Kennedy. Yeah, that was great. I, I it was really, um, you know, Patrick is uh, obviously my cousin and somebody who I care deeply about, and has had his, you know, has his struggles and, and shown the courage. I mean, both him and Jim Ramstead, you know, both you know, public servants who. Basically had their moment of clarity in front of the, in front of the world. I mean, Jim was in a jail cell in, in Minneapolis where he, you know, was you know arrested. He was a state senator out there, and, but you know, and, and he was willing to, to to let his you know his his alcoholism be public. And and Patrick had to you know had to basically confront his his uh, his disease in front of the uh, world's news media. Um, you know, so these are guys who have. And they've worked tirelessly their whole, uh, uh, you know, public careers for uh, for mental health parity, which is a which is a huge issue for us. We've had Patrick on the show uh, a number of times, and his story is obviously uh, quite an incredible one. And it's certainly he has helped many people along the way, as has Chris Kennedy offered in the book Moments of Clarity. A lot of people in the book, Alec Baldwin, originally turned you down and then changed his mind. Chris, why? I asked him again. And, uh, you know, I told him it was important to me, and he has been a good friend for over 20 years. And uh, I, I, I can't thank him enough for doing it. It's not something that he wanted to do, um, but he did it for me out of friendship. And I told him the last time I saw him, I said, when you, if you ever decide to run for governor of New York, I'll go to Buffalo for three months for you. <laughs> You know, finally, Chris, I will tell you that the story that stayed with me the most really should have been the 45th story because it was in the epilogue. And it was a story that Candy Finnegan, who's a nationally known right. interventionist, told about fear, flying, and being a friend of Bill's. Tell us about how that came to be. Well, I had actually, when I, the day I handed in the manuscript, I was on the set of a show called uh, Intervention. Uh, they asked me, they, people in intervention had asked me to come and host a show on recovery where they brought back four or five of the folks from, uh, from their episodes to talk about what it was like being in recovery. And, and I had never done anything like that before. I've been an actor for 20 years, but I had never done a show where you, with a live audience and a, and a, and a, uh, you know, you had to read from a, a monitor and you had to like get everything right. And I, I didn't know what I was doing and I was terrified. And I was standing backstage waiting to go out in front of this audience thinking, whose idea was this anyways? <laughs> and how can I kill that guy? And Candy came up to me and told me about her moment of clarity on a plane and asking, uh, you know, the plane was being rocked by this tornado or something. She was there with her kids. And, and she asked, uh, uh, this called the stewardess, I, I need a friend of Bill's. It's to make an announcement that there's got to be a friend of Bill's on the plane. And this woman thought she was crazy and said, I'm, I'm busy, lady. We're having a major catastrophe. She said, you got to do it, you got to do it, I'm going to drink if you don't do it. And so the woman did it, and then the plane calmed down, and, and the, uh, a, a few minutes later the pilot's door opened, the pilot walked back and, and, and looked down at Candy and said, uh, you wanted to see me? And, and Candy looked up and said, what are you talking about? She goes, well, and he said, well, you asked for a friend of Bill's, and, and I'm it. And uh, Candy just uh, laughed, and, she, and, and the pilot said, look, don't worry, you're you're." You're in my hands, yeah. and he walked back, and his and the kid, Candy's kid, looked up at her and said, "Was that God, mommy?" And Candy said, "No, but close enough." <laughs> they just absolutely send goosebumps up my spine. I know, I know. And she said, then she looked at me. She goes, "The 
just remember you're not alone and walked away and I, I got through it. You have been on the circuit since 2005 in the recovery community talking about your books, Symptoms of Withdrawal, and now the new book, Moments of Clarity. And, and you're very familiar with, with the stigma that we have faced for so many years. Have you seen changes from 2005 until where we are today? And what do you see for the future of this field? I don't really, I haven't seen that many changes, I gotta tell you. I mean, I, you know, I, I think eventually, incrementally it will happen, but I don't, it's like ink in a glass of water, you know, eventually it'll turn, but it's, it, it hasn't turned, and I think, uh, you know, it, this is a difficult one. Um, it's a difficult one because of the way the media, news media portrays us and portrays the illness and that nobody really takes it seriously and, you know, they, there is a thing of like this is a disease where there, you know, people do relapse and people go, well, you see, you can't do anything about that. But, we, but on the on the on the positive side, we we did get parity. Um, there are people talking about this. Um, people are staying sober. Um, the brain research is 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 phenomenal and promising. Um, treatment gets better every day, um, and you know uh, the the. 12 step you know world is 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 still you know thriving so there's a lot to be there's a lot there's a lot to be uh, optimistic about and there's still a lot of work to do and you know I've always said the bright side of addiction is recovery I did a telethon back in Santa Barbara back in the mid 70s with Dick Van Dyke and, and a number of others, right. an 18 hour telethon and the theme that I used was the bright side of addiction is recovery this is what your book is all about the bright side of addiction is recovery you are truly a great ambassador for recovery the book is called moments of clarity voices from the front lines of addiction and recovery it is published by Harper Collins and available at amazon.com and other online book publishers you can find out more about Chris including his speech schedule he travels all around the country by visiting his website www.christopherkennedylawford.com chris i wish you continued success with the book it is a winner i absolutely know it and i'm encouraging everybody i can to go out and buy a copy buy two copies buy one for yourself buy one for a sponsor buy one for someone uh, who's having a recovery birthday i wish you continued success and i thank you neil you are you you are a bright light. You are an absolute bright light of recovery, too, and it's always an honor and a pleasure to be on your show. Thank you for what you do. 